Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Contracts, right? The foundation for a successful relationship. I am Larry Weinberg. And Henry, you want to click the slide and show, uh, get us started here. So, as you can see, I'm a SCORE volunteer and mentor. I've been a coach for approximately 10 years, and I've been self employed as a started off my career as a in the carpet clean business um, migrated to asbestos abatement from 85 to 93 doing mostly public works and then finished my career for over 20 years in a disaster restoration business including being fortunate to having sold my business to quite a national cleaning company so that's me and henry take it away and i'm henry burton i am also a score volunteer and mentor i've been doing this for a couple of years this time I was also a mentor before, and I've been landscape contractor and a business coach for 10 plus years besides working for SCORE. So as Larry said, today we're talking about contracts, um, which in general is just an agreement between two people or two companies or more people um, that is very specific about what it is you're gonna do. Um, so the basic elements of a contract are an offer. So I'm offering, a, I'm going to offer to build a deck for Larry. Um, and so we're going to talk about what that offer is um, and includes a promise to perform. So in the contract, there'll be a clause that says, you know, I'm going to do this uh, in return for valuable consideration. Um, so we're going to lay out the scope of the work. Um, so I'm going to build a deck, certain materials, certain size, location, um, how it's all going to look and there's steps and railing and things like all that. Um, and then there's the valuable consideration, which in most cases is money. But it could also be, you know, Mary, Larry might have an old car that I want and he could use that as consideration for me building his deck. Uh, but most of the time, for most of you, it's going to be money. Uh, and so you need to talk about that with your client or whoever you're signing the contract with. Uh, the contract will also include the time of the event, the time and performance. Um, and so that all needs to be mentioned. And the terms and conditions of any of how you're going to do the work, uh, what kind of materials, et cetera, et cetera. And acceptance of the offer. So up until this point, everything in a contract is negotiable. Generally, you know, if you have a contract, you're going to, have to give it to the client. They're not going to, they may negotiate over the price or the scope of work, but they're not going to say too much about the contract itself. But generally, it's all negotiable. So when you get to the point of an acceptance, um, you're both going to sign the contract. That means we're, we're agreed on this. This is how we're going to move forward. And you're going to start, it's going to have a start date, et cetera, and all that. So there are three types of contracts. Some are more enforceable than others. Um, there's a verbal contract, you know, between you and your buddy. Um, you know, I would, you know, if Larry and I were to do it, I'd say, I'll build you a deck, sure. And he'll say, yeah, I'll pay you, you know, $10,000. And I'll build the deck. And then I say, hey, Larry, I want my 10,000 bucks. And he'll say, what 10,000? I didn't say that. Um, so then it just becomes your word against his, my word against his. It's not the kind of, not the kind of contract you want. And it doesn't do any good for your friendship. Um, so there's the an implied contract, which includes, you know, goods and services. So your grocery receipt is a contract. Um, they're giving you groceries in return for money. Uh, shoe repair, they give you your claim ticket. That's your contract. There's no terms and conditions or anything like that on it, but it, it means that you have a right to that pair of shoes, but they're not going to give them back to you until you pay for the repair. That's still an implied contract, um, which works in most cases for a retail service like that, shoe repair. Um, but what we're, we want to talk about is the written contract, which is the best, because uh, that is enforceable once it's all signed. But it, it's only enforceable to the extent that it is specific. So Larry can't say, I didn't do the job just if I just say, I build a deck. I can build a de any deck. and. You know, I've satisfied the contract if that's all it says. So that's why you want to have specifics in the contract about what size, where, how, um, when you're going to do it. Because I can say I'll build him a contract, but I'll, you know, maybe I'll get to it next year. And he wants it now. So I'm, 
So unless you're specific about when the, when the work is going to be done, how it's going to be done, who's going to do it, which gets us to expectations. So you need to, you and your client need to share expectations. They have, a, they have an expectation of how the finished work is going to look. You have an expectation of how it's going to look and how it's going to be done. So you guys need to be clear about this. And the more you can get this in the contract, the better. Um, so what you're going to be doing, the scope of the work, um, will you be using subcontractors or, or other of your own materials? Um, that's all negotiable. Uh, the main thing here, here is, is the client going to be allowed to help you? Um, as a landscape contractor, I had several times when the client wanted to help me, help us do something. And, you know, most of the time it worked out, but every once in a while, it was not very good. And the friendship didn't last very long after that, unfortunately. Um, so I'd be leery about, you know, letting a, letting a friend help you on your job um, or the client help you on your job, unless you really trust them to be able to do the work. And they know that they have to realize that you're the boss. They're not the boss, you are, because this is your contract and your job. Um, and the other, then the other, the other question is, is this a fixed bid or war out um, or a cost plus time and materials? Uh, so that all depends on you and how you run your business, what kind of trade you're in. Um, there's different expectations for how you go, how you price things. But again, be clear about it in the contract. And that brings up change orders. Any, pretty much any work you do, there's going to, probably going to be a change order of some kind. Um, we just had our deck rebuilt. We, speaking of decks, we just had our deck rebuilt. Um, and we, put, we had a contract. They came and started taking it apart, and they realized the, one of the main support beams was totally rotted out. And so they had planned on replacing it. So we had to sign a change order. It was very clear, just like a contract. Very clear about this is what we're going to do. This is how much it's going to cost. And I had to sign it. They signed it. We each got a copy and they did the work. So I would encourage you to get some change order forms filled out, printed in duplicate uh, so that you can have it when you need it. Um, so you, in the case of, my, of our deck, the guy had a bunch in his briefcase and he pulled them out and we filled it out. So change orders are gonna, probably going to happen and they're just like a contract. Um, you know, how are you going to, you have to document what you're doing? You're going to have to price what you're doing. And you have to agree with the customer. The customer has to agree to what you're pri the pricing. And they have to sign off on it. But the main thing, if, I, if you don't take anything away, anything else away from this present presentation, the main thing you want to think about is communicate with your client. Talk to them all the time. Keep them informed about what's going on. And then document everything. If you talk about um, several years ago, I remodeled my, had my kitchen remodeled and the contractor would come by and do some work. And I'd come home from work at the end of the day and he'd ask me all these questions about what to do. And then the next day before I left for work, he would come over and say, okay, this is what we talked about yesterday. Is this still the case? And I, you know, we agreed. Sometimes I changed my mind overnight, but the thing is he communicated and in these days with email, it's easy just to type up an email. This is what we talked about. Um, just so you document everything that's there, that everything that you talked about, everything that happened. And with that, I'll turn it over to Larry to talk more about the details. Thank Larry. you, Henry. Thank you, Henry. So that next slide, please. And notice that he talked about scope of work and documentation. Even with scope of work, um, things are going to pop up that you might not have expected. And I'm going to give you to start off with some exclusions and some language with hidden and unforeseen conditions. And I mentioned my career the last 21 years in the disaster business. And before this talk, I just looked online, Google the Bible, Google and saw 50% of homes and 85% of commercial buildings will experience a water loss at some point in the history of that building. The industry I was in, I would see every single contractor on their cover page of their estimate would have the terminology hidden and unforeseen conditions are not responsible for. 
Maybe some of you have experienced this. You can imagine a building that sustained a water damage, the ceiling is wet, the contractor is bidding to replace the wet sheetrock ceiling. They take out that wet sheetrock ceiling and lo and behold, there's another layer of ceiling. There's wet plaster that has to come out. They promise they're removing the wet ceiling. Well, they're now required to take out that plaster and whoops, some of that over material uh, plaster might contain asbestos. Well. Unless you put on your somewhere on your contract language, we are not responsible for hidden and unforeseen conditions. We would likely be responsible for removing that asbestos uh, containing plaster because we said we take out the ceiling. That would be hidden and unforeseen conditions. There's other exclusions. And again, with my experience as a disaster contractor, we performed asbestos removal. The very nature of that work requires, if you can envision, you have to build a plastic barrier to keep the asbestos material in the contained area and not get outside. So you're putting plastic on the walls and the floor and you have to sometimes staple it or at minimum use duct tape. And when that work is done, sometimes the duct tape will pull some finish off the floor or might pull some paint off. And our contract language would clearly say that asbestos removal may result in minor damage to sheetrock and flooring. If we didn't have that language in our contract, we would be responsible for repairing those surfaces. We've run across a number of remodeling contractors in SCORE and this kind of language not responsible for shrinkage, cupping, warping, minor damage, and that's gonna occur potentially over 12 or 24 months as a house may settle. So the work, the work may have been up to industry standard, but, but things occur over time. So would you forward to the next slide, please, Henry? So I guess that kind of speaks to warranty and even both of us are talking about building services experience. Warranty, we're used to warranties in the world. We buy a car, there's a warranty, you might buy an extended warranty. Uh, and remodeling contractors, contractors doing large projects, there's an expectation their work is going to stand up to, a, you know, a period of a, a 12 and sometimes even 24 months I've seen, although that's usually an exception. There's also what I would call an implied warranty, uh, which would uh, allude to an industry standard for the work. And for example, our work as a Water damage contractor. If a building got wet, we have to take out uh, the carpet, uh, take out the wet pad, dry things out, reinstall the pad, put the seam back together, clean the carpet. And after a month, if a customer called to say, hey, this seam you put in has fallen apart, um, we would have to come back as an industry standard for quality workmanship to do that repair because the repair work we did was not up to industry standards. So that speaks to warranties, quality workmanship, and would you move us to the next slide, please, Henry? Um, oops, sorry, I missed that the last topic. This, this topic here of dispute resolution. There's gonna be times where you and your client customer disagree about certain facets of the work and maybe the bill. If you can't come to a mutually agreeable solution, what do you do? And your contract language should, should have language that addresses that. One form of dispute resolution if you, the two of you cannot come to an agreement is mediation. That is less expensive than bar binding arbitration. Um, the, larger the, the larger the disagreement, the more likely it could end up there. Fairly expensive, but it's gonna be kind of like a court, but not really a court, but you agree to the term binding arbitration. Again, we've had some remodelers that if they had some issues with jobs where clients were unhappy with the work and wanted to fire them, um, this RCW, RCW stands for the Revised Code of Washington, which is under the auspices of Washington State Department of Labor and Industries, which sets guidelines for construction and clients and contractors, subcontractors. An instance when perhaps you made a mistake on a job and was the, the client got a bid from someone else to fix that for $10,000, this law gives you the right to repair that work, even if they want to fire you for the balance of the job. Hopefully you don't run into any of these types of problems and your argument is less than $5,000. You can, you can serve the client and go to small claims court, but you cannot ask for more than $5,000, but recognize it is a court, there's a judge, 
because of the amount of money in dispute, nobody ever hires judges. But thank you, Henry, for the takeaway of document, 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 communicate, communicate, communicate. If you go to small claims court and just tell a story without pictures, without email, without diagrams, without documentation, you are much less likely to win your argument in court. So I will echo that statement. One thing you have to walk away with, document, communicate. So Henry, thank you so much. Next slide, please. Uh, it seems kind of um, take for granted, but I've seen it with people where they didn't have very good payment term language in their contracts. Um, there are some people that might have cash flow issues and their industry is uh, accrual and rather than cash and don't get paid right away. They may have language that says, if we submit a bill, the, the uh, payment's due within 30 days, but if you pay within 10, we'll give you a 2% discount. There are contractors that are doing work with other contractors involved and maybe they do a phase of work, um, one phase of work and they have to wait a period of time for the next contractor to come in and they may not have to go, they may not be able to go back in for another three or four months. You would wanna have language and progress payments. If I complete one phase of work, I submit my bill and pay within 30 days. I don't have to wait four months for this next phase of work to get it done to collect payments. You also want to put in a due date. I work with a painting contractor that was an exterior painting company, got 30 or 40% down for their work. And in their contract, which was pretty good, except for this one, they had nothing about final payment. He had an expectation, a verbal expectation, that he would be paid upon completion. <laughs> And he had a client that was, you would describe as difficult. And there was because there was nothing in payment due dates, he struggled to get paid and actually had to reach out to an attorney to, to get paid for the work that he did that was not in dispute. So you want to have that language in there about payment. Uh, I've seen contracts that have language in there that if you can't agree, goes to court, that the client has a will pay the attorney fees. My sense is that Washington State courts are not very, uh, don't often award those, but it may give you a little um, leverage with a client that thinks if they do lose their case, they would, they'd be poor forced to pay your attorney fees, but I wouldn't necessarily count on that. I mean, the language in there can help, but don't, don't take it to the bank, so to speak. Henry, the next slide, please. Uh, payment terms, whoops. Uh, Sorry, I just talked about that. I'm not looking at my slide very well. Subcontractors, what if you are a general contractor and you're hiring subs? Uh, you're gonna wanna have your attorney uh, have a contract for them to sign with language that they indemnify you, which means if they make a big mistake, they're, they're compensating you for harm or loss. The additional insured would not be part of a contract, but you would want their insurance broker to uh, to issue a insurance certificate naming you as an additional insured. If they had a large problem um, that they're responsible for, their insurance would step up before you. I've seen instances when uh, a contractor hires a subcontractor and whoops, they're not licensed, bonded, or insured. Um, you can go to that link with LNI and you can verify that that a person, that someone you're hiring does have all three of those license bond and, and insurance because you, you definitely do not want to hire a subcontractor that doesn't have those components because you'll be on the hook. Actually, if you if you end up hiring someone that's not a licensed bonded insured contractor, that is a violation of LNI. And if it gets to them, you can have, you can be fined a thousand dollars for hiring someone that's not licensed. Improvements to real property. Again, the RCW, Revised Code of Washington, that's 60.04. Some people may not know this, but if you are doing repairs or just furnishing a new roof, building cabinets, siding, you are required to provide the, your client with a, with a lien notice. This is required by law. A lot of clients don't know that. Um, I think it's a differentiator. You can distinguish yourself from those that don't do that. And if you're hiring um, plywood supply, someone to furnish cabinets or siding materials, 
they will likely uh, submit to your client a notice of lien rights. In a worst case scenario, you, you don't get paid. If you're following all the paperwork associated with this, then you can successfully lien their property. Hopefully that doesn't happen, but that's one of the options open to you. And again, required by law. Henry, next slide, please. What if you're a subcontractor to a larger, to, to the general contractor? Well, recognize it's not likely that, you, that they'll sign your contract, you'll be signing theirs. And some of the things to look out for when you're signing theirs are, you better read it all and I capitalize carefully because you may end up having to have, next, next bullet point, please, Henry. Um, I've seen them where they're gonna ask the subcontractors to have $2 million of general liability insurance, which is, none of us usually carry that, so that would cost you more money. Next one, please, uh, payment terms. We, we have a number of uh, clients doing public works. Um, uh, you, you may not get paid for a while. The government has to get all the paperwork in, in, uh, in their possession before final checks are paid, and you might be out five to 10% before the job is paid in full. Uh, next one thing is liquidated damages. That's again public works. I have a client right now, electrician, who's working for a large contractor on, on a sale of housing authority, a new building. Um, if they have a time performance to complete the work, and if they miss, it's five thousand dollars a day. Pretty significant, not common, but look at you might have uh, time frames which to complete their work. The next few you can put out there real quick, Henry. You got disputes. You want to look at the language, how disputes are addressed, site conditions. You may have significant cleanup every day, and just look at anything else. So lawyers, I think you're going to want a lawyer to help you with your contract. Um, uh, I had my my lawyer draft contracts. He was a high end land attorney, a land use attorney, and my contract he had disputes would be solved by binding arbitration. I was in small claims court the last time, and this judge was very, very detailed. She looked at my contract, said, you can't be here. Your contract requires binding arbitration, no small claims. So that didn't work for me. So I just want to uh, yeah. I can just jump in here, Larry. Um, I just want to add that it's, it's good to find an attorney as soon as you can and build a relationship with that person. So if you do get into trouble, um, when you call them, they answer the phone and they call or they call you back um, as opposed to calling somebody off the, out of the blue and you may not hear from them for two or three weeks if all if at all great great point and and when to use leads us to the last slide so i call the last slide final thoughts here we've said this more than once a good contract is helpful but it's only the start without your good good communication and documentation uh the strength of your contract will be diminished and speaking of lawyers here's the Cautionary tale, a true story. Um, I, uh, my company did a job with a, uh, my adjective, an unscrupulous, sophisticated, large property owner manager. They had a, uh, a uh, large building in Seattle, old building leaked. We were, our job was to remove the asbestos from the concrete ceilings and the, and the upper two feet of wall from four apartments. And this was a phased job we would do too. Repair those units, the tenants would move to these two, we do the next two. As we took these top two feet of wall out of this building that had sustained significant water damage, we exposed the inner cavity and there had been so much water damage over the years that these metal studs had actually in spots, the top two feet of wall was, were gone, it rusted out. We stopped the job, we called the owner of the company, he, he looked at it, their third party coordinator, the industrial hygiene firm, met us, we looked at this, the agreement was to take out the rest of the rusted material uh, and move forward. So we did that, we sent them a bill, um, our final bill, we didn't have progress term language in there, so we had to, we, had, we couldn't get paid for the first half, we had to wait for the whole job to be done. And when we got our final check, it was short $17,000 with a letter saying, our removal of these studs had compromised the building and they had to hire a contractor to short up the building. Well, our project manager had not executed a documentation that we, we all met on such and such a date. We noted this damage, the agreed upon work was to remove this additional metal stud, agreed and noted by all three parties. He didn't do that. Uh, that weakened our argument. And although that we, 
we did not have the written documentation. Our attorney who would be fighting this unscrupulous owner said, we would likely win this in court, but it's not likely. We likely win in court, even though it wasn't documented because all three parties, including the industrial hygienist firm was there. But we wouldn't likely be awarded attorney fees and the attorney fees would have exceeded the $17,000 we would have collected. So documentation will help, it will always guarantee, and maybe one of the last comments is, uh, take a look at your clients and sometimes uh, some of the best clients you, uh, you get are the ones you choose to walk away from. So with that, thank you so much for your attendance today and we look forward to your questions afterwards. So thank you so much. And our contact info is on the screen there, so feel free to shoot us an email if you have questions. Thank you so much. Thank you.